right, we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, it is great to see everyone um, on this Tuesday morning. Um, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds. Um, my name is Dr. Eric Hong. I am the residency program director in the department. And I also happen to be the co-chair um, for our trainee Grand Rounds um, Research Awards. Uh, I will say having co-chaired this with Dr. Vogelmeyer for the past several years, it has just been incredibly impressive to see the work that our trainees across the department are doing um, with respect to scholarship and research. And today marks um, sort of our second uh, day of celebrating the outstanding work that our research trainees um, are doing. Um, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce um, Dr. Kristen Nishimi and Dr. Aifa O'Donovan as um, one of our presentations, and then Dr. Shuyu Wong and Dr. Dave Minoli as our second presentation. Um, we're gonna turn uh, the stage over to Dr. Dave Minoli, who's gonna introduce our next uh, trainee uh, research award recipient. Dave, the floor is yours. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Kristen and Eva. Um, and to the department for giving us uh, this opportunity. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure for me to introduce Shuyu Wong, um, who is uh, now a PGY4 in my lab and has been a postdoc uh, really since she started in the department. Um, for her graduate work, Shuyu did some really, really amazing work trying to understand how uh, cells actually um, sense specific amino acids that uh, regulate actual cellular growth. And then um, sort of as she was finishing medical school, uh, she then moved to the lab of Evan McCosco, um, who was a pioneer in sort of single cell sequencing uh, data uh, generation as well as analysis. And she uh, developed algorithms for um, using single cell sequencing data to understand or infer protein interactions. Um, and so sort of this quantitative bias to really understanding sort of basic mechanisms in neuroscience is kind of what motivated Chuyu, directly what motivated Chuyu to uh, join the lab um, and really sort of uh, pioneer sort of two areas of uh, work that she's going to be talking about. Uh, the first is really to try to use sort of computational and um, unbiased uh, approaches to understand the behavioral mechanisms that animals engage in when they're uh, developing social relationships and social bonds. Um, and then to model these reciprocal interactions, both in sort of wild type animals, but also in the context then of both environmental and genetic disruptions that affect um, social attachment behaviors um, in clinical populations. Um, and then the second sort of area is to really sort of uh, capitalize upon her expertise in sort of informatics and single cell um, analysis to really understand what are the neural populations that specifically are involved in social attachment behaviors and identify the molecular signatures, both that identify these uh, neural circuits, as well as the changes that occur in them molecularly during the formation of social attachments. Um, and just to sort of end, uh, it's probably not surprising that she has already won a number of awards and I'm just gonna highlight the uh, UCSF Wild Pilot Award for Junior Investigators in Neuroscience um, and a NARSAT grant uh, for Young Investigators, uh, both of which have been sort of instrumental in facilitating her work and you know I think are the first of what's going to be a very long list. And so with no further ado, I'll give it to you, to you. All right. Thanks so much, Dave, for the kind introduction. I'll try to share my screen and keep fingers crossed that it works. Um, all right. Great. Um, is, is one screen visible? Great. Okay. So um, yeah. So so thank you, Eric. Thank you, Dave. Um, it's uh, it's it's really an honor to be able to share some progress um, on the research I've been doing over the last several years today. So we'll be talking about systematic characterization of social attachment behaviors and their underlying molecular substrates. Um, my research interest in the science of social attachment is actually deeply rooted in the clinical experiences I've been privileged to have. My work at San Francisco General Hospital as an intern and much of my subsequent clinical training have repeatedly underscored the importance of social attachments for psychological development, uh, for mental health, and for overall well being. And even now, as I near the end of my residency training, it is no less astonishing to me today how early life experiences, such as one's relationship with a caregiver, uh, can instruct or impair social relationships later in life. Now, being a basic um, scientist, I was inspired to learn more about the mechanisms by which social attachments are formed and disrupted. 
This is not only an intrinsically fascinating neurobiological phenomenon, but also one with deep clinical significance. Now, studying how the brain orchestrates social attachment behaviors on the level of fundamental neurobiological mechanisms has not been easy because none of the common model organisms in use today demonstrates enduring social attachments in adulthood. And without a system that shows robust social attachment behaviors, it would be challenging to identify which genes and which neural circuits are responsible for attachment formation and maintenance. So to this end, I was very grateful to have had the opportunity to join Dave Minoli's lab, where we study social attachment behaviors in prairie voles, which are these terribly furry and cute creatures. Um, it's worth noting that prairie voles are among only 5% of mammalian species that demonstrate social monogamy and biparental care of the young. To better appreciate the range of behaviors that social monogamy entails, it helps to contrast prairie voles with non-monogamous rodent species. For example, mice and rats show time-limited maternal attachment between mom and pups, but not lifelong social attachments as far as we know, whereas prairie voles exhibit lifelong social attachments to their mates. Second, Mice and rats have novelty-seeking behaviors, whereas prairie voles spend more time with their familiar partner than with a novel stranger when given a choice between the two. Mice have little anxiety response when separated from their mates, uh, but prairie voles have quite a pronounced anxiety response when they're separated from their mates. And lastly, mice and rats uh, mate with multiple animals, uh, but in contrast, prairie voles, once they're partnered, will vigorously reject uh, new potential mates. And this last aspect is a really striking example of how a prairie vole's behavior and presumably also its underlying neural substrates is transformed once a pair bond has been established. Given all of this, the prairie vole um, presents a really exciting opportunity to examine a number of key neurobiological processes. First, how do prairie voles discern partner from stranger and how does environmental context affect this processing? Second, how do prairie voles integrate sensory cues with their internal attachment state? And third, how does the integration of sensory cues and attachment state result in the display of affiliator versus aggressive behaviors? In today's talk, I'll share my progress on two ongoing projects. Uh, the first project aims to develop systematic and unbiased methods for analyzing reciprocal social behaviors. And the second project is focused on characterizing bonding-related molecular patterns and cell types. So first, uh, regarding unbiased behavior phenotyping. Why are we interested in unbiased behavior phenotyping? Well, when we think of language, we recognize that words are strung together in a reasonably predictable order to form higher order phrases, then clauses, and ultimately sentences. Grammar supplies the rules that govern how words and phrases are assembled, and our understanding of language requires an implicit understanding of these words and these rules. Likewise, we hypothesize that understanding um, that, that there's a logic to social behavior that is analogous to language. The challenge is that we neither know what these behavior words are, nor the grammar that governs how these behavior words are assembled into meaningful behavior sequences. This diagram on the right-hand side illustrates nine descriptors of animal behaviors shown as features, um, which can collectively specify the sequence of behavior words, which is represented in a color-coded fashion across time. Just as the word jack is often followed by a verb, we may realize that the behavior blue is frequently preceded or followed by the behavior light blue. By developing a model that can detect statistical regularities in the sequences of behavior words, we can begin to understand how social behavior is expressed on the time scale of neural computations. And moreover, such an unbiased approach would render the behavior scoring process less susceptible to the projection of human biases. And this stands in uh, contrast to the current standard in the field, which is manual course phenotyping of social behavior. So the, the procedure of unbiased behavior phenotyping requires two steps. First, we track animals to obtain animal coordinates, and then we assign behavior labels uh, based on these animal coordinates. And I'll start by focusing on tracking. <clears throat> 
we developed um, systems to track 2D and 3D contours, as well as 2D and 3D key points of moving voles. While 2D measurements from regular camera setups are far easier to use and compute, 3D measurements provide more accurate and nuanced representations of animal pose, which can be extremely helpful for unbiased behavior phenotyping. Um, so first, we built a custom pipeline for 2D contour tracking, which we have applied to many um, social and solo behavior assays that we run in lab. Our pipeline has a convenient user interface and has now been used by many of our lab mates. Here is the tracking of prairie voles in the middle of a partner preference test. The focal vole roams freely and can choose to interact with its mate or with a stranger who are tethered to opposite sides of the chamber. And focal voles typically spend 60 to 80% of their time with their partner and only 10% of their time with the stranger. Our contour tracking not only indicates where the focal vole is roaming, but also if it is in contact with a tether vole. A key challenge to accurate tracking is preserving animal identity over time in a multi-animal context uh, without getting identity swapped. To achieve this level of accuracy, we devise a linear assignment problem to string together contours that represent the same animal across multiple frames in a behavior video. And here's an instance of the same animal or of two merged voles coming apart uh, with time. And here is a separate instance of two initially separated voles that merge together. But once these two voles are merged together into a single two-dimensional contour, it becomes difficult to segment the two animals away from each other. To overcome this problem, we implemented 3D tracking with a depth camera, uh, which captures the distance between the camera and points in the frame of view of the camera. But when we uh, so, so shown here is a still frame of two interacting voles. And these would have been detected as a single 2D contour using the approach I just described. But when we take a cross section of the depth data along this vertical line illustrated here, we're able to discern two humps, each corresponding to the body of a single vole. Of note, this cross sectional data, depth data contains interpolated values since raw depth data as indicated here is prone to invalidated or null artifacts, particularly at the interface between objects, such as between the vole and its surrounding, the bedding. Uh, but we're able to apply this uh, intercubic interpolation to infer approximately what these invalidated values would have been. And we see from this diagram that we have pretty good approximation. We also wanted to track key points, especially at the head and the rear, since face-to-face -face sniffing and anogenital sniffing are common and important social behaviors in bulls. We use Deep Lab Cut, um, a 2D convolutional neural network that enables markerless tracking with human-like precision. We train two separate networks, one for dark furred bulls and one for bulls with contrasting coat colors. More recently, we implemented DANCE, which uh, makes use of a 3D convolutional neural network to generate highly accurate and spatially stable 3D key points. Shown here are two of the three camera views that were used to track the nose tip, ears, and tail base um, of a wild type vole. We expect that the ability to track in 3D space could be especially helpful for social behaviors, for which there's often occlusion when viewed from just the overhead perspective. And we're in the process of training our two volt dance network uh, this week. We have since augmented our dance setup to six cameras synchronized by an external signal generator. But uh, even this very first iteration of our three camera network, with the three cameras being here, here, and here, uh, was successful at 3D post tracking. So with our tracking data in hand, we proceed to um, developing methods for scoring behaviors. Here's a more detailed outline of the scoring process, whereby we start with tracking data and generate behavior predictions. Let's hone in onto the first step, um, which is computing meaningful and salient features based on the tracking data. For instance, um, if we had a key point tracking data set, the angles of the four limb joints um, may be useful for specifying grooming behavior, which requires repetitive and stereotype four limb motion. When analyzing social behaviors, however, the challenge lies in how to represent 
the joint pose of two interacting animals um, and how to compute these two animal features. For well-recognized social behaviors for which we have abundant labeled examples, we can train a supervised machine learning model to learn the patterns associated with these labeled examples and thereby ask the machine to do all subsequent inference for us. For example, we built a random forest classifier for huddling behavior in the partner preference test using features computed from our two-dimensional contours. Comparing classifier predictions to manual scoring, uh, we realize that we achieve reasonably good precision and recall. In fact, we now know that some of these discrepancies were due to inaccurate manual scoring. When we analyze the features that account for the performance of this classifier, we see features that make a lot of sense. For instance, when bulls are huddling, the merged contour area tends to be larger. And so it makes sense that the area of the contour is um, an important uh, feature for this performance. Whereas supervised ML models only help us define what we already know to look for, unsupervised ML models can help identify novel behaviors with limited human bias and across a variety of time scales. For example, some social behaviors may take place over milliseconds, a duration that humans can easily miss, but that an algorithm can more reliably detect. Alternatively, some social behavior sequences may span very long time scales above and beyond what humans might be naturally inclined to detect. And so for both of these instances, it would be valuable to explore and develop unsupervised methods for behavior annotation. One approach that we're um, taking in collaboration with Christoph Kirst, uh, who's in the department, is use of the hierarchical Dirichlet process uh, autoregressive hidden Markov model, which is a, it was a mouthful. Um, but here's a simplified illustration of this model. Our behavior data consists of numerous observations of animal pose, illustrated as a time series shown here from OBS1 to OBS N. However, to understand the logic of this behavior sequence, we need to know the underlying hidden state or the brain state that gives rise to each observation with a certain probability. Moreover, there are parameters that govern the number of hidden states or brain states that are valid, as well as the transition probabilities between these hidden states, which gets at likely behavior sequences. The um, HDP or HMM model is able to infer uh, the statistical model for all of these parameters at the same time, given a trove of tracking data, thereby yielding meaningful behavior segmentation. We're now applying our supervised and unsupervised scoring approaches to characterize the behavior trajectory of pair bonding, as well as the reciprocal um, social behaviors of oxytocin receptor null prairie voles at early time points. I don't quite have the data to share with you all today, but um, I hope to have more updates in the near term future. Um, now regarding a second area that I've been working on, um, as many of you know, Oxytocin has now been extensively tested in human clinical trials with social behavior related targets. But this molecule first came to prominence when it was discovered that the reward center in prairie voles bound significantly more oxytocin than a comparable region in non-monogamous bull species, such as the mountain bull shown here. Pharmacologic administration of oxytocin into the prairie vole brain promoted bonding related behaviors, whereas pharmacological inhibition of oxytocin blocked bonding related behaviors. So these observations led us to see transcriptomic patterns in the peripheral brain that may predispose it to forming pair bonds, and also to ask if there are molecular correlates for a critical period for social bonding. Interestingly, our lab recently discovered that oxytocin receptor null voles still exhibit partner preference, which is a key indicator of pair bonding which also motivates us to ask if there are additional molecules that underlie pair bonding behavior in the absence of oxytocin receptor and oxytocin signal. So there are a number of biological questions that motivate uh, our work in this area. First, what are the cell types in the nucleus accumbens and its surroundings? Are there sex specific differences in the identity of these cell types or in the proportions of these cell types? Um, and are there species specific patterns between the prairie vole versus the meadow vole? Second, what cell types respond transcriptionally to pair bonding? Um, especially since we know that the, the prairie vole's 
social behavior changes really dramatically once a pair bond has been established. And lastly, what are the transcriptional signatures associated with pair bonding? So we dissected the nucleus accumbens and surrounding regions from frozen brain tissue and processed our samples with a 10x 3' RNA sequencing kit. Following standard uh, quality control steps, we obtained this clustering scheme, which is illustrated in this two-dimensional UMAP plot. We found that the prairie vole nucleus accumbens has a lot of similar cell types to mouse um, nucleus accumbens. Um, when we compared our data set with existing data sets of uh, mouse nucleus accumbens. We then asked if there are differences in the proportions of these cell types across sex or pair bonding condition. To our surprise, we noticed that most clusters have highly similar cell proportions with the exception of cluster one shown here, um, both in this female versus male comparison as well as in this pre-bonding versus post-bonding comparison. This raises really interesting questions as to what cluster one is and why it shows um, cell proportion discrepancies across multiple comparisons. Uh, unfortunately, the identity of cluster one has, has been quite challenging to pin down since it doesn't clearly map to most striatum uh, or nucleus accumbent databases and have uh, not very obvious marker genes but it's also a sufficiently discrete cluster that does not bleed into adjacent clusters, meaning that this difference or discrepancy in proportion is unlikely due to inconsistent clustering. We also further subclustered large clusters of these cells, including this blob of medium spiny neurons um, shown here in this red box. Um, and we, we noticed that the medium spiny neurons actually separated fairly cleanly into three subclusters. That said, it's important to note that it's usually not clear what level of bioinformatic clustering, i.e. the degree of binning or splitting, is biologically meaningful without appropriate experimental validation. We also wanted to um, examine where receptors for dopamine, um, DRD1 and DRD2 and DRD3, are expressed in um, our cells. Uh, so shown here, we see that DRD1 and DRD2 are expressed quite abundantly in the medium spiny neurons, um, and DRD3 is expressed to some degree through the medium spiny neurons, as well as in the islands of Kaleha in this cluster. We then asked where oxytocin receptor is expressed. To our surprise, we found lower levels of oxytocin receptor transcripts in medium spiny neurons, again this blob here, than we had expected. And we also notice oxytocin receptor expression in other inhibitory neuronal clusters, glutamatergic excitatory clusters, and even non-neuronal clusters. To more rigorously quantify oxytocin receptor expression, we plotted OXTR levels normalized by housekeeping genes such as actin and GAP-DH, and highlighted the MSN uh, populations here in red. So based on these data, it is unclear if oxytocin um, receptor expression in the nucleus accumbens um, as detected in our data set fully accounts for the extent of experimental oxytocin binding at the nucleus accumbens in prairie voles. One intriguing possibility we've wondered about is if oxytocin receptor might be expressed at presynaptic terminals projecting into the nucleus accumbens from an external source a population we did not sample in our sequencing experiment because we only extracted nuclei from the nucleus accumbens. But uh, due to the sparsity of transcripts that is inherent in single cell methods, cells in which oxytocin receptor was not detected are not necessarily oxytocin receptor negative. Um, and without a clear, uh, without sort of profiling a Cre oxytocin receptor driver line, it would be very difficult to assess peribonding related transcriptional changes between oxytocin receptor positive and oxytocin receptor negative cells. Um, we then examined the differentially expressed genes between pre and post bonding states. Um, and we extracted the genes that exceeded uh, a significance threshold and clustered these genes both by clusters and by the differentially expressed genes themselves. The intent behind this analysis was to identify differentially expressed genes that occur across similar clusters, um, which are likely to have meaningful sort of biological significance. And we see here that indeed 
clusters that are more similar to each other, such as where I'm um, pointing at, tend to have similar um, patterns of differentially expressed genes. Um, so just, just sort of as a proof of concept, we wanted to better understand what these genes are and that they specify specific biological processes that would be of interest. And so we focused on this set of upregulated genes in cluster one, which is again, the mysterious cluster that has some neuronal, some sort of support cell type properties. And when I examined um, Go terms or biological themes that are enriched in the set of genes, I notice uh, these patterns, um, specifically uh, modulation of chemical synaptic transmission, um, uh, various compartments, plasticity related genes, um, so not super specific, um, but, uh, but interesting that this, these are the themes that come up. I also um, examined uh, what genes appear in this cluster, which is a glutamatergic cluster. And in this cluster, we see that there are um, a lot of biological themes that have to do with ion channels. Um, and uh, synaptic complexes, which makes sense being a neuronal cluster. Another possibility is that only a subset of cells within a cell type change transcriptionally in response to pair bond formation. Uh, so conceptually related to the idea of engrams, where a specific and limited network of cells show modified activities following a stimulus. Um, so to assess this possibility computationally, I'm testing a logistic regression framework that allows for a transcriptional response in a subset of cells within a cluster, such that some cells um, retain the same transcriptional phenotype even after bonding has formed, uh, whereas other cells, this cluster B, shows a new uh, transcriptional phenotype. Alternatively, we could imagine that two distinct behavior phenotypes might collapse or converge onto a single phenotype after bonding has occurred. Um, and this possibility could explain potentially the closing of a um, plastic period. So in summary, um, just to briefly review um, what I've shared today, we've established 2D and 3D contour and key point tracking systems for measuring social behaviors. We build supervised classifiers for known social behaviors, and we're in the process of developing methods for unbiased social behavior phenotyping. We've also performed single cell sequencing on parable nucleus accumbens and the paraventricular nucleus, which I didn't share in detail today. And we've started to generate a number of biological hypotheses from these single cell bioinformatic analyses. All right, so this is really the most important slide. I have many, many people to thank. Um, first, my mentors, Dave Minoli, um, and also Christoph Kirst for giving me the opportunity to work on these interesting uh, areas and encouraging me to sort of, uh, you know, stretch the knowledge, uh, stretch the limits of my own knowledge. Um, I'm also extremely grateful to have been, work, to have been able to work with um, a, a group of really wonderful and dedicated volunteers. I'd like to highlight Kara Quine, Who's, um, who's been a volunteer in our lab for the last two and a half years and with whom I've worked very closely on the behavior phenotyping project, as well as Audrey Jordan, who's a tech in our lab now. And really, I, I need to thank everyone in the Manoli lab for, for making it such a, um, a motivating and learning friendly place, especially since I, I joined the lab uh, um, with very little neuroscience background. Um, I also have to thank our RTP, Susan Vogelmeyer, for leading research residents, as well as my co-residents in the basic sciences, Belinda, Yun, and Susan, um, RTP alumni, Kristen, Chris, and David for their extremely helpful advice over the years, and of course my uh, residency classmates, class of 2022. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Show you. Um, great. I'm going to actually turn it over to Matt for the first question. Oh, I'm unmuted now. Um, I'm happy to, to uh, defer um, to uh, anyone else who wants to ask a question. I, I, um, I the um, 
the finding around, you know, so the differences between those early, you know, kind of seminal insole experiments and what you find when you have the, when you have null oxytocin nulls, um, have, have you or others gone back and just tried to reproduce those initial experiments? Do you, are, are you really trying to explain conflicting results or is there a possibility that there were technical problems with those early experiments that have led people astray? Yeah, so I think the, the longstanding question in these sort of classic experiments by Tom Insull from 30 plus years ago is um, the pharmacologic addition of oxytocin or antagonist um, can not only affect oxytocin receptor, but potentially also other related receptors such as vasopressin receptor. And so it's always been a question of um, were these pharmacologic findings specific to oxytocin signaling itself or a confounder of multiple signaling pathways? And in fact, experiments are ongoing in uh, the Manoli lab right now by some of my colleagues to try to, um, to try to do this pharmacologic activation and inhibition in our oxytocin receptor null animals um, to better understand if, uh, yeah, if, the, if the genetic interaction we're expecting holds. Thank you. Not sure if the chat is working, if people are trying to put uh, questions in there. So if you want to raise your hand, um, that probably is a little bit easier. Um, I guess while people are, oh, we have one question from Belinda. Huh. How do you, how do, uh, how do differentially expressed genes in the single cell data, how are they analyzed and do you use pseudo bulk methods? Um, so I've used both single cell methods such as Wilcoxon, ring, their Wilcoxon and MAST, as well as pseudo bulk methods such as um, DESeq2 and EDGE-R. There is some overlap um, between uh, these different methods and, um, uh, but, but there are some differences as well. You can imagine that the success of um, identifying differentially expressed genes via pseudobulk methods depends on the quality of the cell clustering. If the cell clustering is at issue, um, then, uh, then pseudobulk methods, but also single cell differential expression methods could be affected. Um, but, but I think it's, it is worthwhile to analyze both single cell and pseudobulk methods because they each have their own pros and cons. Yeah, just while well, we have a little bit of time, I was kind of curious um, about your thoughts on how, for example, specific mutations, right, that we know are associated with, you know, for example, autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia or other clinical um, syndromes that affect attachment. Um, how do you think that the sort of unbiased phenotyping um, that you're developing, what do you think that will show in terms of uh, the deficits in behavior, you know, that we identify at a global scale as saying they do or don't attach? Um, but at the level, at the resolution that you're looking at, uh, where do you think that those sorts of things are going to manifest? Yeah, so um, you know, genes that have now been linked to um, neuropsychiatric disorders with attachment-related um, deficits can interfere with behavior or with attachment at a number of different time points over the lifespan. Um, it could interfere with early development, uh, adolescent development, or even sort of adult sort of behavior. And so uh, right now, we're hoping to use our quantitative methods to study um, the patterns of behavior on timescales that we define. Uh, we're interested in understanding if um, we can look within just the sort of a early time point and see if there are already um, behavior features that suggest a difference between mutants and with wild type animals. Um, without the sort of high level of behavior analyzing resolution, looking at the early time point alone might not be sufficient data or might not be sufficiently rich data for humans to be able to know uh, what to look for in terms of behavioral differences. Um, and so ultimately we hope to sort of trace the trajectory of how an animal's social behavior changes um, over time across these different time points from early childhood to adolescence to adult. Um, and yeah, I see Marie just posted uh, mm -hmm. um, trauma in the child hole. Yeah. 
So, so hopefully we can compare um, uh, the, the other challenge of using these mutants is that um, we don't quite have a common language for understanding how these different mutants are different from each other. So it would really help to have the sort of basic vocabulary of behaviors so that we could even compare one mutant to another. Um, and, and some of our quantitative approaches, we, we hope to be able to introduce the framework to allow those types of comparisons at defined time points of interest along the developmental trajectory. Wonderful. Well, I am looking at our time. Um, Descartes, I, I know that you have your hand raised. If you'd like to make a concluding comment, we welcome you to do so. Uh, All right, just quick comment. Just, I was very interested in the um, unbiased, you know, um, uh, uh, behavior tracking, just would be curious about applications in humans and thinking about like, whether we could predict emotional states in humans, mania, for example, uh, relationship attachments in humans, whether your marriage is going to last, stuff like that. Anyways, those are just my science fiction kind of thoughts as I was listening to you talk. Thank you so much for a great talk. Really interesting to me. Yeah, um, yeah good questions. And I think there's, there's actually a lot of people interested in the idea of uh, how can we sort of leverage the large amounts of data we can now collect and analyze to better infer um, internal states that um, individuals may or may not have the opportunity uh, to express. Um, and so my understanding is that there is ongoing work in using some of these automated approaches um, to analyze the movements of individuals who are under consideration for an autism spectrum diagnosis. Um, and so that, that seems to be um, that, that seems like a really important uh, and key area to start work in, uh, but I'd imagine that this work may expand into different um, clinical realms uh, in the future. Uh, the, 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 the tricky thing is having enough data and data in the right context to be able to trust the sort of behavior patterns that we see. Uh, and, and I also see one question from Julio in, in the chat um, about phenomenon of pair bonding that takes place in the wild. So, so that's a really good question and a really important one. Um, we, we like to think that uh, we are uh, reproducing key aspects of the social attachment behavior voles naturally have in the wild in our laboratory. Um, and we see that actually 90% or so of the male-female pairs that we set up end up showing a partner preference um, to each other. Uh, so, so 90 percent of, of the pairings seem to seem to result in some sort of pair bond formation. Um, uh, so it, that said, you know, we have to acknowledge that we're not replicating all aspects of behaviors that take place in the wild, where animals live in tunnels underground, um, encounter different types of stresses and different types of sort of environment building demands. Chu Yu, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. I also want to thank Kristen for a wonderful presentation as well. Um, thank you, everyone, for being a part of the Ground Rounds today um, and congratulating our trainees who've just done some really outstanding work. We'll see you um, soon for the next Ground Rounds, and everyone have a good rest of your day.